Yes. Okay, there we are. All right, let's do that again. Good morning, church. Good morning. Wonderful to see all of you again this morning. Um, this morning, as the worship team was praying, I think we were just reminded about how important it is to uh, thank God and come with a heart of thanksgiving. So for this morning, uh, can you find a partner, preferably someone you have not spoken to uh, through the course of the week, and share what is one thing that you are thankful to God for this week? Okay, I'm going to wrap us up. Indeed, we really we could go on and on and on uh, sharing with one another just about how good God is and the blessings that He has poured into our lives. So, I encourage you, after service, continue to share with one another. Um, so, for today, we continue to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And as we have been seeing in the previous weeks, uh, Paul addressing some of the issues raised in the church. Today's passage addresses the issue on the resurrection body. As some were asking what the resurrection body will be like. So let's turn, uh, and the verses will be on the screen, to 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 42, verse 42 to 49. And this is uh, Paul's reply. Uh, let's read it together. Okay, One, two, go. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead, the body that is sown imperishable, it is raised imperishable, it is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory, it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, the last, Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man is of heaven, as was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, 
so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. So in this passage, we learn that the resurrection body uh, will be different from our present earthly bodies. While our earthly bodies are weak, imperfect, aging, uh, outwardly we might feel that we are wasting away, and sometimes, and many a time, inwardly we feel that we are struggling with sin, uh, we have hope that these earthly bodies will be raised imperishable, sinless, powerful, and glorious. And while we eagerly await for that day to come when Jesus comes, and you know when we cry out, how long more, uh, we, we do not lose heart. Because we who are in Christ, uh, behold his glory, his perfect, his sinless, his holy self. And as we do that, we too are being transformed into his image day by day with ever increasing glory. So let us pray and let us commit this time uh, to God. Praise you, God, for you are glorious, you are holy, you are awesome, you are worthy of all our worship and all our praise. We thank you, God, for your grace that we can bear your image and that we can become more like you. So, Lord, as we gather to worship you today, help us to behold and to contemplate your beauty and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So, let us stand. Um, and as we sing the next song, Celebrate, Jesus Celebrate, let us clap our hands and let us sing with joy. Let's clap together. Continue to sing and praise and shout for our Redeemer lives.
our living hope. Bye. 
church as we sing the next song soon, I would like us to fix our eyes on Jesus and call to mind his very words from Revelations. And he says, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of God. Never again will they leave it. Let's sing soon. Soon and very soon God, we thank you for your word and your encouragement to us when you say, I am coming soon, and that, Lord, we will always be with you. So, Lord, help us to look forward to your coming. Help us not to grow weary or lukewarm or to lose our first love for you. But, Lord, in these last days, we ask that you stir up 
in our hearts a greater hunger to know you and to make you known. Lord, help us live each day on this earth with eternity set on our hearts and to glorify you in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. My test one, two, there you go. Okay, um, once again, a very good morning. Members, friends, visitors joining us for the first time. It is um, no denier of that reality, even as we gather as believers, assembly of believers here, we do deal with the subject of death and resurrection. Yet for us as believers, the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ continues to be our hope and our confidence of the afterlife as we think about who Jesus and where Jesus is today. Each week, uh, each Sunday of the month, we would also remember the Lord's Supper. And it is significant because it also reminds us that our time on earth is short because the scripture says there will come a time that you and I will gather as a great assembly of God, of multitudes of people, nation tribes and all at a great banquet with our Lord Jesus Christ. So this morning as we remember the Lord's Supper, as we partake of it, I'd like us to point us to a portion of the scripture that we have read earlier on in our uh, se series on 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? And the bread that we break together on the first Sunday of every month, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Beloved, this, in preparation for this morning's Lord's Supper, I'd like to lead us to consider an aspect of what it means to participate. The word here would mean to fellowship, to be in communion, to be in union with our Lord Jesus Christ in His death, and in the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'll do that using Romans 6. And as we read through a short portion of the scripture slowly, I'd like us again to consider what God's word says about the implication, the effect of you and I who are in union, in participation in the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, in the body of Christ this morning. And I'll point out some things for us to remind, to, to prepare ourselves for Lord's Supper. Let me read from verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. Next verse. Next verse, please. For if we have been united with Him in a death like this, we shall certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like His. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin 
once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must also consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let us let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obedient is to, uh, to make it to make you obey its passion. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And your members to God as instruments for righteousness, for sin will, not, will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. In a text like that, at least there are five principles that I'd like us to contemplate before we partake of the Lord's Supper. These are things that's related to our union, our oneness with God, for all of us who have professed our faith and our belief in our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me join the first and the third point together. You and I are dead to sin. Through our union with Christ, we are participating in His death. By taking, breaking of the bread, we are remembering, we are participating once again in Christ's death, where our old self, the sinful nature that is within all of us, are crucified with Christ. It means that sin has no longer dominion over us. It means that our union with Christ has break the chains of sin. You and I are no longer slave or enslaved to sin. At the same time, Romans 6 will remind us that that speaks about a newness of life. Just as Christ was raised from the dead, you and I to experience newness of life. By many of our obedience unto baptism, that will be symbolic of our profession of our faith that we will have died with Christ and we will have rose together in a new life with our Lord Jesus Christ. We no longer are the same. We walk a transformed life that He gives, a life that is purposeful, a life that we begin to live for Him and not for our selfish desires, where our actions, our thoughts and our choices should reflect this new union with our Lord Jesus Christ. Yet having said, the death to our old self and the newness of life, verse 14 will remind us, all these people is the grace of God. It is the grace, the unmerited favour of God upon you and I that we can die to our old self and live a new life. This morning when we can gather here, it's the grace of God. This morning when God calls us as a children of His, it's the grace of God. This morning that we can partake of the Lord's Supper as a family here, it is the grace of God. And we continue to depend on God's grace day by day for the forgiveness of sin and for the living out of our new life in Christ. I urge you to be encouraged as we partake of the Lord's Supper. I ask you to therefore recognize that we need God and His grace mercy and compassion day by day. So let me just give you a short moment right now to ask God therefore to prepare your hearts and we could prepare by perhaps confessing and repenting of any known sins. Scripture says where members are offered to idols, where members of our body are offered to sin. You could think about you know, the use of your eyes, the use of your hands in recent times the use of your mind, in fact, what is it centered upon? And I give you that space and that time to confess and to repent of any known sins. I may lead you, therefore, also now to give thanks to Him, Jesus Christ, for His sacrifice on the cross. Just thank Him. You need not have many words. Thank you, God, for dying on the cross for my sin. And then I give you that opportunity right now. He says, Lord, I recommit I surrender my life once again to your Lordship and to your leading. 
I commit perhaps my body, my spirit, my soul, my body, let me be used for your glory. Brothers and sisters in Christ, friends who have joined us this morning, it was that evening that Jesus was soon be betrayed. It was during that last meal while Jesus and his disciples were eating. That was where Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body broken for all of you. Would you join me to pure off the first layer of our communion cup? There within is a waffle that symbolizes, that reminds us in a very visible way, our Lord Jesus Christ's body that was broken on the cross for your sin and my sin. Let me just give thanks and let me just partake of it together with you. We give thanks again, Jesus Christ, for the body that is broken on the cross for my sin and our sin together. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you partake of it together with me? And then by Jesus' instruction, later on he says, after you have taken and eaten of that body, he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it again to the disciples saying, drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of my covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. So the cup symbolizes his blood poured out for the forgiveness of our sin. It symbolizes the new covenant that God has made with you and I that is based on grace which is also eternal. Once again, would you peel off the next layer and let's partake of the cup together. Let me just lead us with a prayer again. Dear Lord Jesus, each time when we partake of the Lord's Supper, it gives us an opportunity to check ourselves, to reflect upon our union with you. For that itself is a participation in the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ and also the fellowship of believers. And yet, Lord, we are looking forward as the team reminds us again, God, that there is a death and therefore a resurrection and the finality of things that we will be with you in heaven. So help us even as we take it by God's grace, perhaps another month later on, that we may be reminded of these things, of eternal things in you. Even as we collect our tithes and offering right now, again, God, that symbolic giving is a needful reminder for all of us that the things of this earth will fade away. It will come to nothing. What matters most, O oh God, is our allegiance and our union with you. And so God, we want to be a responsible steward of all that you have given us so that Lord, when we give, we can bless those who are in need. We can bless, O oh Lord, those who are in need materially and more so spiritually. We give thanks for this opportunity again to collect our tithes and offering. Bless everyone as we give back to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us also collect our tithes and offering right now. Uh, again, there are two means you could do so in the physical boxes here. And if you like to, there is an electronic means that is via the QR code listed down there.
please allow me to lead with a prayer for our children. I understand there is a something special program for them this morning, but more than the program, I pray that, Lord, through the time together of interaction, of teaching, of play, there may be a wonderful time of experiencing and knowing you as they partake of their activity together. Bless our little children as we celebrate in our local context a, a children's day. I pray again that our children will grow up to revere you and to honour you and to come to know you. We give thanks again God for our children and the teachers and for the rest of our time together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me release our children for their Sunday school. To me, I trust that it is a healthy sign, especially when we release our children for their Sunday school. Maybe about 40% about of our congregation has also moved out together. And that is really why upon my heart, um, the need to also invest in our next generation by giving them quality lessons and also family life together. I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Has anybody come across this phrase or this proclamation before. And I wonder where have you come across that before. I want to give you an answer. It is found in that Apostle Creed, which is also known as the 12 Articles of Faith, where evangelical Christians and denomination has embraced these 12 statements. They consider them as their essential biblical doctrine that they will affirm without reservation as a proclamation of their faith. It is in the final two articles in this chaff that states, I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. By God's providence, by way of our systematic study through 1 Corinthians, we are coming to an end, but we are at 1 Corinthians 15, on this very important subject of resurrection. Paul's concern has been to refute those who would deny any resurrection of the dead. And he will do that by arguing the absolute necessity of the resurrection for our Christian faith. Because if there is no resurrection, then Christ's Christian faith is all a myth. And Christians would be, of all people, most to be pitied. You have believed in something in vain. Now, Paul was also obviously concerned about the newly convert that was gathered in the church of Corinth. Because by their pagan understanding then, who did not believe in resurrection, this false teaching continues to infiltrate the church. So Paul was jealous to teach them the truth. He was jealous to write in a way to encourage them to be steadfast in their faith and their hope in Christ's resurrection and Christ's second coming. Now, people, scriptures and many historical accounts ascertain Christ's resurrection and therefore our resurrection. One passage that we have read earlier on just this month, verse, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 to 4, for what I received, I pass on to you of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scripture as what has been prophesied. In 1 John, in John chapter 11, Jesus himself spoke of him being the resurrection. He says, I am the resurrection. I am the life and whoever believes in me will live even if he dies. Well, Scripture is also un uncovers for us that the resurrection it will be a physical one and it will be for both believers and non-believers. John chapter 5, verse 28 to 29, Do not marvel at this, 
for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out those who have done good to the resurrection of eternal life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment, eternal fire. In Romans 8.23, so you and I, we who have the first fruits of the Spirit, now we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons and daughters, the redemption of our bodies. Dear church, the Bible affirms the reality and the significance of our resurrection. The question is, do you and I believe in the resurrection of the dead and life eternal? Do not be surprised, as I say, even today in our modern context, like those in the church of Corinth, they are skeptical about even the doctrine, the teaching of death and resurrection. They claim, as verse 12 says, how can there be resurrection? And if there's no resurrection, let us eat, let us drink, for tomorrow we will die. And then they will ask questions like, how are the dead raised? How can it be? Dead body burned into ashes in the tomb or in the grave. How can a material things like that be raised into what? They ask. What kind of body are your Christians talking about? What are our answers if some of our close ones ask us that question today? I think knowing the answers to these questions are essential for at least two fronts. At least on a personal note, having clarity on your resurrection and mine will further strengthen our faith and our hope in Christ. What you will realize in today's sermon, it will transform our perspective even as we live in honestly a decaying body since the day you were born. Our body is decaying, not just physical. You, look, you read about the mental, emotional depression that is taking on in our society today. You think about the persecution and the suffering that is taking on in the world today. And having understanding of the resurrected body will further strengthen our faith and our hope in Christ. That hope of our body less, bodily resurrection will shape our priorities and our concern. It will influence our daily choices. On the second front, I think it's essential because having clarity on our resurrected body helps us in our gospel presentation. We learn about the good news of Jesus' death. We must also present the good news of Jesus' resurrection and by implication, our resurrection in Christ when He comes again or when we die in our physical body. So none of us, whether believers or not this morning, can escape the frailties of the body that we hold on to in this life. None of us can escape the reality of death. Whether you are seated young as like me this morning, or whether you have aged so far, none of us, because of sin, everyone, Scripture says, all our bodies have been in decay, all of our bodies will one day be burned into ashes, at least in Singapore context. Yet, yet, we will be raised, we will be resurrected bodily, either to live eternally with God for believers or live eternally in hell for those who persistently choose not to believe in God. Thus, a clear understanding of how can, how will our body be raised, and what will our bodies be transformed to is essential. Let me invite Amos once again to read today's text for all of us. And as we do that, I hope it will be helpful to just consider God's word together. Okay, so verse 35. So, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives his body as he has chosen, 
and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, what is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown in a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Famous. This is my sermon outline. I will use the two questions that some of the Christians in Korean have asked as our outline from verse 36 to 42. It seems that Paul was answering that first question, how are, how can the dead be raised? And second question, verse 42 to 49, with what kind of body do they come? The big idea of today's text is God will resurrect, God will transform our earthly bodies of one kind into a heavenly bodies. And then we will see four descriptions at least in our text that describe the body that you and I will take on when we see Christ. Verse 36 to 44. How will the dead be raised? How can? In this first segment of verses, Paul sought to answer the first of their two related questions, I believe, posed by the skeptical believers in Corinth. But someone will ask, how are, how can the dead be raised? As shared earlier, those who were seeking answers to this question, they did not ask out of a curiosity. They were, as I said, skeptical about the whole subject of resurrection. And so the tone that they've been asking is, how can it be, you believers, that the dead can be raised? They were mocking at the Christians who believe in the resurrection. Now look at Paul's stern rebuke in verse 36 immediately. You foolish people. He calls them foolish. In other words, he almost calls them, you are senseless. To that people, you lack perspective. You are short-sighted. Paul rebuked them sternly. He exposes their foolishness. And he was going to use two analogies at least to prove that God can and God will raise every one of us, the dead, and give us a resurrected body. The first analogy Paul uses to support his claim is the sowing of seed. Verse 36, B. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel perhaps of wheat and of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen and to each kind of seed, his own body. Paul makes the point that God can and God does give new body after death as seen in nature. In the case of any plants, the natural process of planting a dead in other words, a decaying, disintegrated seed, results, it rises up to form to be a new body as God determines. In other words, the mystery of a resurrected body conceptually is no greater than the analogy of that seed that died and God can raise that seed into a form or a body of that plant that God chose. To give. It is as such. 
The concept of seed and growth is not new in the scripture. The people would understand from Isaiah 61 verse 11, for such as the earth brings forth its growth, and as a garden enables seed to spring up, so people, the Lord God, will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. So it is a very simple answer to the skeptical believers. How can the dead be raised bodily? Then the answer is, God will raise the dead, everyone, and gives him or her a resurrected body. It is as simple as that. But the point to note is that though the forms are different before and after, in other words, when you sow a seed, you get a disintegrated dead seed, but when it is raised up, you get a pure, beautiful flower, plant, and so on and so forth. But what is worth noting is that while the forms are different, the life, the soul, the spirit within, the identity remains the same. This is important for our understanding. Let me repeat that. Though the forms before in the earthly body and then the resurrected body shall be different. But clearly, in the analogy of a plant, you sow a particular seed, you get a particular plant. In other words, your identity will not be lost. I want to suggest at least that our memories, our personalities, and our experience will not be lost. The life, the soul, the DNA remains who you are. I'm excited because when I go heaven, I can recognize you. I've not long forgotten any of us. And that is the precious truth to remember. And more so, the personality and even the experiences. You will come to a greater awareness. I don't know in full. Paul continues to illustrate God's sovereignty, ability, and power to give forms and bodies as he determines, and he used now the analogy of creation. Verse 39, For not all flesh is the same. There is one kind for humans, another kind for animals, another kind for birds and fish. Well, there are heavenly bodies, then there are earthly bodies. But, again, strong words like that, but the glory of the manifestation of the heavenly is of one kind, and then the glory of the earthly is of another. There is a manifestation, a glory of the sun, of the moon, of the stars, and even the stars differ from stars in its glory. Well, at least in these verses, Paul is pointing out that God already makes different, unique bodies as on earth. And don't be surprised. Why would you be surprised that God can make a heavenly body, a resurrected one? He's continuing his argument that God can and God will because as seen in nature, again, human, animals, birds and fishes have varying bodies. Then accept it that there could be heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. So need not be surprised. It shall be so. But the emphasis I like to point out is what Paul Werther says, there's a clear distinction now between the heavenly bodies and the earthly bodies. There are heavenly bodies, verse 40. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. But the glory, in other words, the manifestation of the heavenly is of one kind and the glory of the earthly is of another. This glorious distinction between our earthly body and our heavenly body will be contrasted in details in our next segment of verses. So the summary that I have, even to Paul's simple answer to this supposedly dilemma that these foolish people had was simply this. If you are familiar with seed that dies and rises to take a complete different unique form as God has determined, and if you can accept that God has created form, body, bodies, forms for varying animals, creatures, and so on and so forth, as it were for different places and environment. Verse 42 says, So also it shall be for the resurrection of the dead. It is an analogical approach that Paul has taken to prove to us that God will raise the dead. Everyone 
and give us a resurrected body. Paul then moves on to answer the skeptic's second question. With what kind of resurrected body do they come? And in verse 42 to 49, Paul explicitly states that the resurrected body will be one that is imperishable, it will be glorious, it will be powerful, and it will be spiritual. Paul begins to contrast at least four contrasts between our current earthly body that we all have right now, and he contrasts it against the heavenly bodies that you and I, who have placed our faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, will have. Verse 42, what is sown is perishable, and what is raised is imperishable. The perishable refers to our present body. It is subjected to decay, which ultimately leads to death. Our body, our physical body, will perish in the grave. It becomes ashes, etc. Now why? It goes back to the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve decided to disobey God and eat the forbidden fruit. Sin has entered into the arena, into the world. And as a result, humanity, God says, becomes subjected to the consequence of sin, which includes physical decay and mortality. Well, that's not the end of the story. God says there is a contrast available for anyone. The body that is in heaven, God says it is imperishable. That earthly body can be transformed to an imperishable body that would exist, that would last for eternity and now under the reign of Christ's kingdom, which is an eternal kingdom. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24. That when Christ has destroyed every rule and every authority and power, we reign with Christ in His kingdom forever. It is an imperishable body. Paul would develop this idea about perishable to imperishable later on in next week's sermon. I'll leave that, I think, to a subsequent week. Um, for our speaker to share on that. The second contrast in verse 43b, it is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. The word dishonor will remind us of humiliation. The word dishonor will speak about a degree of shame and the whole idea about lowly. And the one person that we will always remember who in the eyes of the world and maybe in our hearts too, which is true, that died in a very humbled, dishonored way, is our Lord Jesus Christ. We could think perhaps now, even in our present body, you and I will die, at least most of us, the effects of disease that cripples our body. We will die one day, maybe with the marks of aging, at least physically. You and I will die one day, perhaps with even sometimes birth deformities, accidents, tragedies, and the like. And that's why I put myself together with every one of us. All of us will one day die in certain degree dishonor. But that's not all. Paul contrasts it, it shall be raised, that same body shall be raised in glory. What Paul is saying, it shall be raised, therefore, to a state of righteousness, perfection, honor, and glory. It is what Paul says, that God will transform our lowly, lowly body to be like His glorious body by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. First, an imperish perishable to imperishable, Second of which of dishonor to glory, and the verse goes on to say, it is sown in weakness and it is raised in power. Well, weakness, we could refer back again to what we have talked about, subject to decay, illness, and mortality. I could also think in terms of Paul, when he used the word that God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. We were then reminded of maybe even beyond the physical affliction there will be the emotional distress that you and I experience. 
It could be even a distress that comes from a concern for one another, a concern in Paul's case for the church and the believers, that weakness that comes upon him, and even the challenges of people accusing you, Paul, for who that you are. I could think about weaknesses in terms of maybe sin's temptation, the weakness of our flesh. Though we speak about the victory in Christ, but because we still put on an earthly human flesh, you and I are tempted day by day to give in to the weakness of that flesh into sin. What is sown in weakness, God says, is going to be raised in that power. It is that divine might and strength in that new body. It speaks of no illnesses, new, no pain, no suffering. It is what I call a final complete victory over sin because there is no sin in heaven. I want us to look forward to that new body where you are no longer tempted by sin because sin is no more. You are raised victoriously in a new power, in a new might and strength. Last but not least, it is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. All that is said, the bodies that function within the limitation today of our earthly existence today, the limitation of it all, age, death, illnesses, mortality, it is going to be raised in a spiritual body. And to clarify, we will not be like spirits, bodiless, flying around. The word spiritual body is not in the sense of being immaterial, but it is a heavenly body filled completely with the spirit. It is a spiritual, physical body, if it helps you. You and I are not going to be floating around bodilessness. Body that will be fully empowered, as I said, by God's Spirit. Bodies that are perfectly aligned with God's purpose of worship. No idolatry. Free from sin. Free from weakness and decay. That is the promise God has given to you and I. With what kind of body would they come? Then the simple answer, but I believe an answer worth our lifetime of contemplation and understanding. It is a body that is imperishable, that is glorious, that is powerful, and that is spiritual. I need us to take time to dwell upon this truth. So Paul is reiterating again, verse 44b, so people, if there is a natural body, please accept there will be a spiritual body. He reiterates his ongoing argument. If you believe there is a natural body, then be convinced there will be a heavenly resurrected body. One that is imperishable, glorious, powerful, and spiritual. Verse 45, Paul further proves and argues his point regarding the natural and the spiritual body from the Holy Scripture. In verse 45, thus, Paul points us back to the Scripture. If you know the Scripture, it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, referring to Jesus Christ, became a life-giving spirit. Let me just stop there for a while. So in verse 45, Paul again contrasts the nature of an earthly versus the nature of a heavenly body. Adam, in the case of Genesis, that first human was created by God and he was given life as a living being. He exists. His existence was earthly and it was natural. God created that in a natural rhyme. Whereas the last Adam, referring to Jesus, is fundamentally different in nature. He became a life-giving spirit. In other words, his resurrection and his victory over death brings heavenly life to all who would believe in our Lord Jesus Christ. That is again that contrast Paul is repeatedly pointing out to his audience. There shall be a difference between the earthly and the heavenly body. Verse 46, Paul gives the order which these events unfold. First, you and I put on our earthly bodies, 
which is now currently subjected to decay and mortality, these are natural. Every one of us dies. They are a part of our earthly existence now. But Paul contrasts it again. People, there is an afterward. There is an afterlife. There is an eternal. Paul is emphasizing here that our resurrected body will be a spiritual and a heavenly one. They will not be mere physical body. They will be infused with divine power, glory, so on and so forth. They will be imperishable. They will be spiritual. He argues on. Verse 47, still on the story in Genesis, Paul talks about Adam's origin and Christ's origin and thus their respective nature. In verse 47 and 48, since one is from dust, so naturally the body made from dust shall one day decay, perish, and goes back to dust, as natural as it is. We don't deny that. They will return to the dust of the earth, in other words, death. However, however, because Christ came from heaven, not from earth, Christ came from heaven, those who are of heaven, you and I, who believe Jesus as their Lord and Savior through faith, will be like Jesus with a heavenly body that is imperishable, glorious, powerful, and spiritual. That's what the scripture says. With what kind of body do they come? Then the simple answer, it will be an imperishable, glorious, powerful, and spiritual body. You need to accept that. You need to internalize that. Paul, in that last verse, brings the concept. He used the analogies now to personalize it and I need us to land at the right place. Verse 49 is significant. What Paul is doing is no longer going to explain from the conceptual level. He personalized the concept by saying, now, just as you and I have borne the image of man of dust, that is when we were not saved, but now, as those who are in Christ, you and I, shall, which has a present continuous tense, be the present and the future, the already but not yet complete yet, you and I shall also bear the image of Jesus Christ. Paul moves from the concept to the personal application now. If that is true, and that is already proven to be true of the resurrection, you and I must ongoing be transformed, be bearing the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul brings them and brings all of us again to the relevance and the significance of all that has been argued. We talk about God, we talk about God who will resurrect and raise our earthly bodies to be heavenly bodies. That is a concept, that is a reality. But if that is so true, you and I who previously bore the image of men when we were sinful, you and I shall presently and in future now bear the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul introduces a whole image here, I mean a huge new theological idea where men men's bear the image of God. And I like it because you're at by, by biblical theology is correct. You and Adam and I was, uh, Adam and Eve were made in the image of God. At the end of all things, when all is finished, we shall be transformed completely into the image of God. Well, that image goes beyond the physical, definitely. I think it refers to the character, it refers to the behavior. Jot that down. The image of God refers to His character. We will be bearing His character, His likeness. We will be bearing His behavior. And we say, why character? Why behavior? My understanding at least, if we are truly safe, our character and our behavior, our image 
must match to the heavenly bodies that God has promised for you and I. If the heavenly bodies is one that is glorious, that is perfect, I trust and I know that the inner being, the character, who you are, must match the heavenly glorious one. While we can be sure that these would not be perfect, when I, I meant our character, I meant even our behaviour, while these wouldn't be perfect like Christ on this side of heaven, the encouragement is to increasingly bear the image of Christ. For one day we will completely, we will fully bear His image when we see Him face to face. One that completely matches the heavenly bodies. I'll draw all things to a landing now. It feels actually like a rebuild again to the Korean church. I sense he's almost saying, if your character and your behavior are like the skeptics, what did the verse say? They ate and they drink, and tomorrow they think that tomorrow they can die. Then Paul is saying to them, Paul is saying to some of us, be weary. You probably may not even be in Christ because you have not understood the significance of Christ and His resurrection in our lives. You, you are bearing the image of the first Adam and not the last Adam, Christ. Can you see Paul going one big round to highlight the implication of the resurrected body for all of us? But if you truly confess, profess Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, then let us bear the image of Christ in your character, in your behaviour more and more because you have understood the significance of Christ's resurrection and ours. The hope of our bodily resurrection must shape our character and behaviour and thus our priorities and our concerns. I'm bringing us to the application. I want to repeat that again. The hope of our bodily resurrection must shape our character and our behaviour and thus our priorities and concern. Beloved, every teaching in the Bible is never for knowledge, nor simply theological discussion, nor even mere acceptance at the intellectual level. Every teaching of Christ is intended to transform, to prepare us, even in the Lord's Supper, who we are and how we live our life in light of the resurrection. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection transform who we are and how we live. How are the dead to be raised? What kind of body will they come? My simple answer from today's text is God will resurrect and transform our earthly bodies into a heavenly body, one that is imperishable, one that is glorious, one that is powerful, one that is spiritual. Don't miss that. But don't let that stay at an intellectual and conceptual level. Paul is saying clearly, therefore, Bear the image of Christ. Put on the character and the behavior of Christ in light of His second coming, in light of our resurrection. That the hope of the bodily, bodily resurrection must shape our image, our character, our behavior, and thus our priorities and concern. So if we truly believe in the resurrection of the dead and the life everlasting, then how does this hope influence our daily choices? We need to reflect on how our priorities might shift if we are truly living with eternity in mind. Are we investing more of what will fade away? Or are we investing our resources, our time, in what will last forever? How can we align our ambition, maybe even relationship? and other pursuits with that reality of that resurrection. 
for every one of us. Dear brothers and sisters, my encouragement to you is hold on, hold fast in faith to this glorious reality on this side of heaven. Surely in this short season, in comparison to eternity, we will be, we are clothed in a perishable, one that will be sown in dishonour, one will be sown in weakness, one that is of a natural body. Well, like Adam, we are who we are because we have disobeyed God at one point or another. And the Bible says the consequence of our disobedience of sin is death. That's the prerogative of the God who created one in determining the consequence of our disobedience, which is death. None of us can escape the frailty of life and death because you and I have all sinned. Yet the second part of that same verse is of importance because it says the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. God did not leave you and I alone in that sad, wicked state. God has not left us to pay the full consequence of our sin. He sent His one and only Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sin in order that He might redeem us and give us eternal life. To demonstrate that death has lost its sting. Death is swallowed up in victory. Christ rose victoriously on the third day, appeared to many and has risen back to heaven. Such is the love, such is the compassion and the mercy of God for all of us. I believe it is also not without purpose that today we suffer in our perishable, dishonoured, weak and natural body. I believe as we experience the fallen nature, you and I begin to long, to seek, to hope, and then to finally appreciate the heavenly body. I recognize also, therefore, our need of salvation through the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ's death and resurrection day by day, moment by moment. By each gathering like that, when we sing songs of the gospel to one another, we are reminded our life does not end here. There is a life after with our Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel that was preached to you, which you have received, in which you now stand, by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the truth, to the word I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. Let that truth and reality shape our perspective. Our earthly struggles and limitations are temporal. Our eternal destiny is glorious. We are not just waiting for heaven. We are waiting for our new bodies, a glorious body that will match up to our glorious image in our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to leave you with that so that you will not eat and drink and think tomorrow we can die, but rather whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, we do it all for the glory of God. May God's word encourage you in your faith this morning. Let me pray. Father Lord, thank you. Thank you again, God, that your word is life. And even by the hearing of your word, it calls forth again, God, to a deeper understanding of that reality and it is a spirit that lives within us that begins to convince us and begin to transform and cause us to live in that new image in Christ. So I pray you help us, O oh God, because easily we could settle at that intellectual, conceptual level. I pray that you help us bridge that gap, that that knowledge will move into our heart, that will transform the way that we live, the decision that we make, in the light of the eternity that God we have called us to. I believe in the resurrection of the dead and the life everlasting. We give thanks to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me? There is a very appropriately written uh, song that almost articulates the 12 articles that I spoke about. 
But let us sing this song with an affirmation. This is like a proclamation. Okay, and when we sing this song, let us declare, let us affirm your belief as a child of God. So Grace and Worship Team, would you lead us in this please? Let's sing it from the chorus.
before you be seated, would you turn to the person left and right and profess your declaration, I believe in the resurrection of the dead. Would you do that, please? Then you be seated. Can please be seated? It's a declaration of our faith. I hope it comes again, as I said, not in the intellectual, but in the heart. Um, we will give a miss for our time of 